So are we, are we ready? <laughs> are we ready, everybody? Yeah! Woo! Oh, that's... <laughs> um, so, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Welcome to Pratt Institute, uh, New York City Jewelry, Jewelry Week's 2022 Education Partner. We are extremely honored to be participating in this year's New York City Jewelry Week with an incredible lineup of exhibitions and events. And this is a big one tonight. Um, I'm Professor Patricia Medea, Fine Arts Jewelry Program Coordinator. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to 30 years of 10,000 things retrospective exhibition. When Ron Anderson and David Reese launched 10,000 things 30 years ago, they captured the zeitgeist of the moment in their groundbreaking minimalist jewels. I am beyond grateful to David and Ron for accepting Pratt Jewelry's invitation to host this extraordinary exhibit. Um, tonight, Marion Faisal, founder and editorial director of the Adventurine Online Jewelry Magazine, jewelry historian, editor, and author, will take us through David and Ron's incredible journey. In 2021, Marion acted <clears throat> as the guest curator for the beautiful creatures, jewelry inspired by the animal kingdom. Yeah. Exhibition at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm like, I'm sure so many of you saw that, right? All of you probably saw that. Fabulous exhibit. Um, next month, Marion's 10th book, on 20th century jewelry design that she co-authored with Lynn Yeager. B is, <laughs> um, B is full, B, sorry, I'm so sorry. B is for Bulgari, celebrating 50 years in America. Will be published under the new imprimatur, the Adventuring Limited Editions. <laughs> Please, please welcome Marion Faisal, David Reese, and Ron Anderson. Thank you, Patricia. And to the people seated in the back, we do have two seats up here if someone wants. Oh, one is saved, Karen Karsh. I know everyone in the audience, you will be called out by name, is saving one. But there is a, Michael, do you want to come up here? <laughs> Michael has been working on this exhibition for 24 hours a day for three days. You want to know who mounted the paper? Yay, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all so much for coming. This exhibition, I have to say, means about as much to me as Beautiful Creatures did. Um, I feel like about two months ago, David really innocently took me out to lunch He's looking the other way. <laughs> At Cafe Clooney. And he was like, oh, so, you know, Pratt asked us to put together an exhibition. And would you uh, join us for a conversation at Pratt? And I was like, oh, yeah, I would love to. I mean, I've known David and Ron for just about 30 years. And I was like, that would be easy and fun. And I really don't know what happened. <laughs> but next thing, I, I, I swear I don't. But next thing I know, David is introducing me as the curator of the, of the exhibition. And um, we have been working on this for, really, it's been about a month, but it's been pretty intense. I don't remember what I did before this because I've done nothing else. I'm not sure how I'm going to pick up the pieces and move on because it's been so much fun to do. And um, all of you who are here who know David and Ron know that I am speaking the truth and how much fun it is. Um, 
But I did want to give a special shout out to everyone, to Michael, who's in the back, who mounted um, the, uh, all the paper, <laughs> along, with, um, <laughs> along with Chris from Pratt. And um, you're not going to believe this, we had two mount makers, which is almost as many as we had at the Museum of Natural History. I am <laughs> not exaggerating. One was from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One was from Pratt. Um, I mean, it really took a village. Sarah Beltran, the jewelry designer, even came in at one point and kind of, you know, play, you know, did a still life for us of all the objects on the bottom. We had all hands on deck, and um, you know, we loved every minute of it. Sasha, there's one seat right there. I told you I know everybody. <laughs> You can sit in the front. This is what happens to people who come late, <laughs> who got caught in traffic. Anyway, to get to the point of this exhibition, one of the reasons I think why it's been so much fun for me is because Ron and David began um, 10,000 Things in the 1990s. And I began writing about jewelry in the 1990s. And it's the first time when I could really say, this is what happened because I was there and I saw it. So um, just to set the mood a little bit with my glorious 1990s slide, there was no time to, <laughs> I will take us all back. And what was happening in the 1990s? I mean, obviously there was no internet. There was no email. Um, that didn't come around until 1994. 1992, really, when you two were underway, um, if anybody's watching The Crown like, right now, like I am, that was the Annas Horribles. You know, that's when Charles and Diana were dominating our headlines. The TV show Friends started in 1994, and a young 46-year-old president named Bill Clinton was about to go into the White House in 1993. In fashion, in music, we had um, grunge happening. What was it? Yeah, grunge. We were talking about Nirvana and Hole blasting from the studios. And in fashion, there were winds of change as well. And um, Kate Moss appeared in an American fashion magazine in 1992. It was the first time she appeared in an American fashion magazine. C.K. Calvin Klein ads. I mean, David, you know more about this than I do. She well, actually, Michael knows the most about that. He was there for that shoot. <laughs> See, yeah, Michael really should be in front. <laughs> <He really doesn't laughs> I know. <laughs> but, but you said, anyway, she was 18 years old. She was locked up by Calvin Klein. He saw star potential there. I mean, obviously had a good eye for talent. But she was wearing in this ad their cross earring, the small, so it's, this is the first um, credit that 10,000 Things received. And pretty much it was off and running. But before we go off and running, quickly, um, I want, <laughs> this is, yeah, right. <laughs> perfect response. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the first headshots of David and Ron in 1995. And I just wanted, because maybe, I mean, I know so many people here know David and Ron for so long, but maybe you don't know quite exactly how the jewelry started. So, Ron, <laughs> can you tell us when you first started dabbling in jewelry in Detroit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit, Elang sounds, for, you, you have to take a microphone. It's on. The green oh, light. On. Hi. <laughs> I worked at a store. Um, it was a chain, Elong Elong, and they had them here. Uh, they had them all over the country. But it was costume. It was costume. <laughs> it was costume. Um, and I was doing repairs. It was simple plier stuff, but it was fascinating. So I started, I'd go to flea markets. I'd buy broken pieces. I'd put it back differently. Um, the owner of the store said, I really love what you're doing. You should make jewelry and we can sell it here. And she, I love her for that because she really just, she was so supportive, you know, and um, that's what I started doing. And I'd come back on Monday and everything would be sold and I would be surprised. I'm like, you know, you don't know when you're hitting the mark. You're just making what you want. And, um, it's what did so it look like? <laughs> <laughs> what did it look like? It looks like earrings that Lucy would wear, basically, and I love Lucy. And, um, you know, they used to sell those uh, 
little perforated uh, clip-ons, and I would string things. So I'd go and I'd buy like a broken strand of crystal, and I would turn into a pair of earrings, and uh, just sort of went from there. I mean, it was it was so funny because Chanel was really big, and any Lang with the giant. We were selling Butler and Wilson and all of this glass stuff, but it was beautiful. And um, I was just doing my version of that, yeah. basically. Yeah, we talked a little bit when we were putting all of this together, and um, all of us are from originally from the Midwest. I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say we're all New Yorkers at this point, but we we're originally from the Midwest, but, but Ron's Midwest experience was a little different than <laughs> the cornfields that, that David and I grew up in, because you were in Detroit. Yeah, I mean, it and, was nice. And you had Aretha Franklin it coming was nice. through. It was nice. And it was nice. A lot of style, but yeah. you had a desire to move to New York. I did. Um, my dear friend decided to go to Parsons, and he just said, you're coming with me. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and I had $75. His family packed up his stuff. We all drove here. We had a dear friend who... Um, was in an apartment, was at 14th and 1st. Her roommate, who was also from Michigan, was going back to Michigan. So we had a bunk bed and a double bed, which she slept in, and, and Jason and I slept in the bunk beds. And we just sort of did our thing, you know? And the next week I had a job at Barney's because the shoe manager was someone I knew from Michigan. <laughs> so, <laughs> It was kind of crazy, you know, you, when you think uh, the stars line up, they really did. And, and I'm grateful for that. For sure. And it's kind of a legendary story in um, jewelry at this point, because you and, and some of the ladies that are here from the 92nd Street Y were pointing out your big um, crystal and wire bracelet in the center case in the exhibition. And you um, used to sell jewelry on a table in Soho near Castro. I mean, it was kind of it, people that were on those tables in Soho were it was, going places. Yeah, it was basically, it, it was like we had our own, uh, it was a mall. You knew everybody there. Everyone had their own space. You didn't infringe on their space. We all looked out for the cops because it was not legal. <laughs> um, but we all adored each other and respected each other. I had a dear friend and she sold dried flowers and she made the most beautiful arrangements. And um, so I was in front of a beauty salon on West Broadway. And I had a TV tray, and I had a beautiful piece of uh, green silk velvet that I would drape over it. And I was just doing these wire-wrapped pieces. And it was really, it was super, super free form. You know, it was different than what I did in Michigan, but, um, I adored it, and I just remember the jewelry designer from Chanel bought a piece, and he said, what are you doing out here? I said, I don't know, waiting to be discovered. And he said, well, you've been discovered, and he bought a piece for his girlfriend, and it was, you know, it was just, it was just a nice story, you know, and it felt good to be appreciated by someone else in the business, and, you know, of course, I was obsessed with Chanel jewelry, so it was like a, just kind of a crazy thing, but you know, that's why I moved to New York. You know, Jason was just like, let's just do this. And um, I'm very shy, so I don't even know how I was able to set myself up on the street um, and just talk to people. You know, that, that still baffles me because it hasn't gotten any better, you know, <laughs> 30 plus years later. But, you know, you, sometimes you just have to do what you have to do, and you find that you enjoy it. And because there were friends around, and, you know, I met Castro on the street, I'm wearing his piece, you know, years later. But it was just amazing to see, like, this genius out there selling his work, you know? And I fell in love with it, and um, David and my friend Andrew Lynette bought this for my birthday. You know, and it's like a treasure. Um. So, but then you did meet one other person when you took your jewelry to Linda Dresser. <laughs> oh my God. Which was kind so of. Much <laughs> no, actually, so, I did a runway show. Oh, and, you did? 
it was written up, uh, Jenny Nathan, and it was the Eccentric Observer newspaper at the time. And I did a show for Isaiah, who was a African American American designer um, back in the day, who did like these chic bodycon pieces. And a friend I worked with at Barney's, she was just like, "Oh my God, you have to meet this guy. He's so amazing." And unfortunately, a year later, he died. And um, still being connected, the new designer said, "Listen, I like what you do. Would you please do?" the first collection with me. And I did that, and um, there was an article written. Um, Cynthia Bailey was the model, which is also kind of crazy. And so this woman interviewed me, she took the photograph, you know, it was Isaiah, it was myself. Um, Catherine Ditline, who was a buying agent, and she read everything, called me into Linda Dresner. Um, her office was basically in their basement and kind of kikied a little bit about like my presentation was less than uh, incredible. But she was just kind of like, listen, there's something here and she is very nurturing. David was looking and he was kind of like, listen, you gotta get this together. I, I see what's here. That sounds like and <laughs> I still say that. No, he does. And you still have to get it together. I'm not a merchandiser, I just, um, you know, I see a color, I make it out of that color, and he's like, do a blue one, but I'm like, why? <laughs> this, this color is perfect. Um, but, so it was another one of those universe um, coming into play, you know, I'm so grateful. I call it a web. Like everyone I've ever met, I was supposed to meet. And then I met David, and then the magic happened. Because David, is as creative as he is a uh, brilliant um <laughs> no 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 he he is great in business and i mean he he was with linda and, and a buyer and so he really um knew what he was doing you know when you learn from her and he Took did over. that yeah i Took mean over. but he's also a creative genius so uh, let's not and he there are very few people who have both of those talents i just want to put that so you two launched 10,000 Things. Yes, we did. There you go. It was nice. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> and he rambled. <laughs> <laughs> He's so shy, really. Normally, we didn't think he'd say anything. <laughs> this was a miracle. This was unprecedented. I'm glad it's on tape. <laughs> so I just wanted to put this picture up of Christy Turlington, which is in the exhibition, because it's 1993. So, so when um, David and Ron launched 10,000 Things, they really did tap into exactly the right fashion moment. And you know, just being an editor, it was there was nothing. There were very few fashion designers at all at the time. And part of what took us so much time in the beginning to put this exhibition together is because there were so many credits. And when I say so many credits, I'm not just talking about Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and Mademoiselle and W Magazine and, and all these things. I am talking about, wait for it, everybody, I wouldn't allow this in the slideshow or the exhibition, <laughs> TV Guide. <laughs> <laughs> This has the, it is addressed to Ron Anderson. I won't reveal, I believe you still live in the same apartment. Yeah, TV Guide, uh, November 1996. I don't know who this woman is. Law and Order? Law and Order, uh, on the cover. They're still filming this and they're still making the same earring because that's how good it is. This is the, the beaded collection that, uh, but anyway, I mean. Children, if you don't know what TV Guide is, <laughs> this is a magazine that used to come to your home and you would schedule your life around what was on TV because it was, there was no streaming as well as no internet. So um, uh, Christy obviously is wearing a, a 10,000 Things necklace, but then you two really got rolling because you picked up a torch. Well, he picked up a torch. Okay. But first we went to the public library and we went to the Met and we looked at things because that's how we uh, figured out what we wanted to make. I mean, at that time it was mostly, you know, we had to make a business and we're self, 
taught. So there wasn't a, you know, an educational background to lean into and we just sort of like figured out, let's go look at things and see what we, what speaks to us. And so the primitive collections and the early uh, jewelry collections, Roman, Etruscan, uh, Greek, all of that really spoke to us. And that's kind of where we started to uh, decide what we were going to make or how we were also then going to take what we had already made and push it forward. Yeah, because this, I mean, I think that this picture on this slide really shows it so beautifully. And a lot of times, if you're hanging out at 10,000 Things, as I have been doing, you see Ron with the uh, magnifying um, things on all the time. It's almost, it's the kind of jewelry we have a little magnification in front of the necklaces in the exhibition. You really do have to pause and take a breath and look closely. I'm like, who is waiting at the door? <laughs> you can come in. It's Come in, okay. Ann. She can sit. <laughs> I should have known. Every, everyone's from the 90s. Everyone here is. <laughs> but if you look closely, it's like the gold granulation um, <laughs> of the, the 11th century hoop earrings there. What made you pick up a torch, Ron? What did make you pick up a torch? I would love to know. <laughs> <laughs> it was visualization. It was just trying to figure out how to hold the bead on. And I literally, which is so creepy, just remembered mercury. And just the fact that if you break, well, back in the days when thermometers had mercury, if you break it, it balls up. And what you realize, it's like, oh, if you liquefy it, and it just happened to liquefy at a very um, low temperature. So it was like, how do you... I knew that metal did that. And so I just went and bought a micro torch. Um, it's the only thing that... Did you do it in your apartment? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I didn't really think about it. I want to tell you that I did not know that. <laughs> this explanation, I didn't know. This no. is your life. <laughs> I'm going to sit there. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I always felt like I'd been here before because there's just weird things that you don't... I was like, how do I... Why am I making these connections? And so what? Let's say I played with fire when I was young, but it was really to get metal to melt. And it never really did. But that's when I went to Toback and saw that they had the microtorch. And I thought, mm, I bet this can do it. And I just because practiced. Days, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no. in, not 30 years ago, nobody was using microtorch. And now, I, and we couldn't find people to work for us. My, Ron invented the whole process of doing it. And now you, I didn't even know this. I'm so impressed. Mm. It's, it was a, he thought it out. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm your biggest fan. I realized that that's how the synapse, and that's yeah. what happened. But for it, us, it was like to move away from assembling, which is story 101 and then start to make a finer product and start to make, a, make something you'd never seen before, and that was always our goal. It's, it's incredibly difficult to do. Oh, Granulation. We couldn't hire people. I mean, there is a lady here. And we still talk about her every day. And what she told us oh. to do. Yeah, because I know that when they're talking about the Greek granulation that's here, it's kind of like you put the gold balls over the gold surface, and then you kind of have to hold your breath and go, Shoo! and something like that. It's incredibly difficult. Well, yeah, you tip, it's like tipping. Oh, don't give away secrets. <laughs> yeah. That one is, that don't one, tell that is so out of the bag. Let, let, let's just say it's incredibly <laughs> difficult to do, and it's something that might even be overlooked. And no. I think that's a lot of the charm of 10,000 Things, is that some of it is so secret and private and personal in this jewelry. It's, it's kind of a gift to the people that get it. And the foxtail, I really am so pleased with this picture that I found at the Met Museum oh. because um, th it looks very much like the foxtail that you guys made. This is one collection you don't make anymore. Well, only because people won't make it. It's, you know... <laughs> when the, you say people, though, but I you mean, guys... people. <laughs> he won't make it, and I, I try. I think Madison I, uh, is sitting out there. I think we can teach can Madison probably. to make it because <laughs> Madison, Madison can, can do it. anything. She could probably do it. Madison's did like, it, no, I'm not interested. But Annette has her own life, but Madison could definitely do it. it is, but you guys did the original yeah. ones. Yeah, and yeah. the point was to take a chain that was solid and 
you know, pierce it and make it do things that it hadn't previously been made to do. And it became very labor intensive. And I think the examples that are in the case are really, I wish we could still make them. They're so beautiful. And it was really, They're so really beautiful. Hard. They're really stunning jewels. And if you see, I think that what David is saying is kind of illustrated here by this Met Museum because it makes the fourth century masterpiece <laughs> look a little pedestrian because it has That's this right. pendant hanging down in the center. They just slip it over. That's no big deal. But look at what's happening in the 10,000 Things jewelry. I mean, they are doing what they do consistently with their designs, which is they're taking this metal and curving it around um, the gemstones. So that's something that we see again and again. And so when you started, one of the things that you did, because pre-internet, pre-retail you know, retail online, <laughs> David has a microphone. I have it's a dangerous. better one. <laughs> um, you opened the store on 19th Street, and some of us were remembering it when we were looking at the exhibition before we started. And it was kind of like people walked in and they said, now, wait, what are you selling? <laughs> <laughs> There's jewelry in the center case, but it was pretty hard to see. It, it was, uh, you know, it was a, and, and people who are here that are jewelers, and especially students that may want to, like, think, what am I going to do? How am I going to make this work? We wanted to move it out of Ron's apartment, obviously. <laughs> I mean, Annette worked in Ron's apartment. It, you know, it got to be a little crazy, and we thought, well, what's the highest rent we can afford, and what should we do? And so we found a space, and then we wanted to experiment with interiors. Like, and so all of our stores, we've always made everything in the store and worked with fabricators. And this particular store was like our, you know, our first, it's our baby. That was our baby store. I still wish we could have it, but it was. Um, Tell us a little bit about some of the details. Like, I can switch here. Well, the here. floor is, was done by this friend of a friend who was, uh, worked for, uh, what's his name? Geary. Frank Geary, thank you, for Frank Geary, and he Little came up... A little-known architect named Frank Geary. He, he made a... Um, he decided that it should be like an Agnes Martin drawing, and so most of the... And it sort of is, or painting, and most of the... Most of our references for this store were art-based. The Of course, you have Joseph Boys, who, you know, used concrete and wood and felt. That's why we have the felt. And at the time, I mean, you can look at that felt and think, like, ah, it's felt... That was like, nope, that was the first time anybody had woven it to be that thick. And so we thought we would make the shelf. I'm like, wait, where's the felt? It was in the first, go back. Uh, it's okay. that on the, and we slumped the glass. That's and, case. But the, and, yeah, that was Annette's case, by the way. That was an effort Nance's case. That's right. That case. That's right. That was Annette's case. <laughs> um, and the, but the thing that I love the most about this space is that center divider, which was made from a, a material that's no longer manufactured. It was, it was gray fiberglass, and it looked like solid, like, solid, like a solid cloud. You, it, and it was meant to just divide the space. And that was kind of inspired by, what's his name, Robert Irwin? Yeah. Robert Irwin was sort of the person we took. And then the boxes, of course, are like uh, Judd. You know, the, those kind of influences were always our influences, and they still are our influences. But this was our first, like, attempt at an interior. Yeah, it was legendary. And um, you've had several boutiques since then from... Several, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of heartbreak the, along but this, the way. This one, for, for all of us who saw... I mean, they were all, they've all been incredible, but this one was really something special. Um, so... Mm. This is getting a little more into gems, and you're, again, this constant desire to always show gems in a special way, with, like with the foxtail. And, um, you know, again, this might look like something quite simple, but really it's not. Can you tell us about the chiclet? Well, I kind of wonder what Ron thinks. I mean, to me, I just <laughs> describe it as we had to move away from, you know, the, the first piece is like the case in the 90s. It was all things you could find. You could go somewhere. We still go to the same guy. 30 years later, he's still there. Kumar, Stonex, if anybody wants to buy Joan. Give him some business, we love him. But it was what you could find. And so one of our journeys was to make things that you couldn't find or, think, or make things in a way that you couldn't find them so that it distinguished what we were making. But it was also because we needed to do that for ourselves. I mean, you know, he's a pretty special creator and we had high standards. So we were always trying to work to our own standards. So when we made this very deceptively simple thing, it was because it didn't exist anywhere and we wanted to make a stone pendant that a lady didn't have. And, but we also wanted to use beautiful gem material and keep it on that line, which is the same line we still use. That's our signature chain that we've since day one. And um, 
that was what that was. And it was a tremendous, I mean, it was really, it's really your it item, or one of several it items, but definitely your it item. I mean, talk about the pictures that I kind of pulled off <laughs> and would, yeah. wouldn't allow. The lot and left the, on the, the cutting precious, room floor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the chiclet was worn by um, Kate Hudson in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, and you know, for all the artistry behind it, and it was worn by Julianne Moore and Alice, and um, just countless piles, pay, piles and piles of editorial for this piece because I think that, you know, a phenomenon with 10,000 things is that you may not know exactly why you think something is special, but you know when you're looking at it that it's unlike anything else, even if it's just minimal and small. Um, and that kind of goes along with your charm necklaces as oh, well. Oh, I love hearing that, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, for me, that's the most depressing part of the exhi exhibit is all of these things are gone and they've all gone to people and we can't get them back and we love every single one of these like I mean honestly and I Madison's can't even look at these pictures. Them, you know? <laughs> Unfortunately she can't. She would though and could that's for sure. Yeah so can you, you talk a little bit about the charm necklaces and what you you do here in your inspiration? Well I would like him to because I didn't know this was again something I didn't know. You're uh, learning a lot tonight. Well, but he said, Ron said that he was inspired by uh, assemblage drawings of uh, Louise Bourgeois. And so when you look at that, I mean, I didn't know that. I guess I did, but it's pretty clear that this weird composition of shapes and beautiful natural materials is very much directed through his uh, vision of um, that, those two things being very much the same. And again, I mean, if we're looking at the mounting on these um, gems and pearls hanging from the pendants, we're never going to see like a bezel or a prong or no, 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 no. No, we, oh, go ahead. I think a biggest, the biggest part of it is how to, it's all about the material. You find the extraordinary material, you don't want to cover it. So a lot of time is spent making holders. So then you're putting these things together so you have to make a holder, which doesn't cover much of the stone, but you also have to figure out how to make it dictate where the stone's going to lay, so to speak. Um, and you want it to look good at the same time, so you're doing this with aesthetic in mind. Um, but that's why all of those U-shaped things, which are cut up pieces of uh, hoop earring. Uh, <laughs> no trade secrets. Yeah, exactly. And, um, it's I'm magic, like, it's I'm magic. Like, I like the shape, I'm reusing it. And you know, so it's as simple as that. And it's like, oh good, it's far enough away, the chain goes through it, um, and it lays well. You know, I don't like it, drop it down a little bit. You know, it's unfortunate that a lot of the things, they're not like cast pieces, they are fabricated each time. Um, and sometimes it makes me kind of crazy because I'm like, well, the stone is wider. I don't want to recreate the, a similar necklace. I want to hold it until there's other beautiful pieces to go with it. Um, that is for sure. But then it has to be. We'd have one piece if we let him. Know. Production and David goes, no, 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 it looks fine. And then I see it on a person. And I'm like, oh yeah, that looks good. Oh, I think you can make a charm like this um, in ten minutes. If you have beautiful materials, just throw them together. No, but, but that's what you get it's from never Louise. Like that. It's like you put the pieces. It looks random, but it's not. And yet they've you know? survived 30 years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, how did it happen? How did it yeah. ever, ever happen? Um, and then and these are, uh, again, okay, I did allow this because, okay. you know, J-Lo's having nice a moment. You. I mean, people in the audience uh, know I'm a J-Lo fan. And, um, you know, it's... Can you see the necklace on her? Can, I mean, it's small, but David, please share with everybody the pop culture moment. Well, can I, tell, can I tell both stories? Yes. Okay, so, I don't know if you remember, but J-Lo and Diddy were arrested in 1990-whatever. So in, when, when J-Lo went on MTV to kind of defend herself, she was wearing that on necklace. On MTV. And, and I just thought that was about the most glamorous thing in the world. And then 10 years later, of course, we, you know... Wait, why were they arrested? I forgot. Oh, some gun thing. I don't know. Does anybody know? Yeah. See, we don't forget J-Lo. <laughs> but, Sorry. <laughs> but so then years later, this guy bought her the bigger version. 
and that's she what married gets him. Her there. And she married him after that. And she married him, <laughs> and then she divorced him. But the, the story of the Briolets was um, actually uh, popularized by this young lady right here, An uh, Andrea Lynette, who wrote about them for Harper's Bazaar and pointed out that <laughs> nobody had ever um, used those diamond Briolets. I mean, in the very, very beginning, we had to insist, and he did, because Mr. Yeah. High Standards insisted, and it was all about just having a, like a water drop or a light something that reflected light that was almost minuscule and nobody was they were not drilling beads holes through diamonds but they did and that's where that came from yeah and and the, the one i mean this emerald one is pretty outrageous can you tell us a little about about that well one? The, you know you have four you got to have more like the that's where i come, <laughs> that's, that's where also, i came can, in can you can you give them the date on that oh the date well we still make that that yeah. that is from the the met uh, the Brilliant and Black. The Brilliant and Black show. That is yeah. the uh, fine quality emerald briolet. 2021. Necklace. Just piled together there. So that's, um, that's what we did. And then this is really, and now for something completely different, but not, um, the sculptural collection. And again, this is one of these moments when, you know, David and I are slaving away, going through magazines, and Ron kind of waltzes through the room and goes, oh, I was inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe's orchids. <laughs> I mean, literally, it's like can, can, everyone can see it, right? You know, it's like inspired by it, but then created such an original um, shape and form and the way it's all pieced together. And um, speak to this, please. Well, well, he's got, he has to speak to that. I mean, the sculpture, we, we, our process is we both do things and we both work on things. But um, of the two of us, I'm like much more linear and Ron's more dreamy and... And it's more, uh, I love to hear, what, I like to hear him talk, so I would rather you talk about it. No, it's, it's just one of those things you're looking at something, you see layers and you see um, what it's, it's kind of like birth almost, uh, you know, Georgia and her, what she was thinking. And, and um, so I just started making fluid shapes in wax sheets and just, attaching and attaching and attaching and I don't know it's I can say these things after the fact because whatever I was inspired by that quickly just kind of went away and was you know it's like the way I think the way I speak I ramble and so it just be, something becomes something else and it's um, oh my god there's things on the bench that have been sitting there for 30 years 25 years but I only I did two of these necklaces there's this one and one that was um more of a collar, and it was, what do you call it? Uh, what's that stuff called? The glass? Enamel. Enamel, yeah. Um, thank Thanks, you, Mallory. Mallory. Um, uh, clear uh, turquoise enamel on it. And then I, I blackened it, and it sort of glows this see through uh, blue. And that was it, because it was just too hard to make. And I just didn't think, nobody wants to buy this. Meanwhile, the first no, he didn't want to make the it. The first one sold. It's so hard. They're I so hard to make. I didn't want to sell it, but um, no. I mean, I just love uh, George O'Keefe and Louise. It's just kind of like every. There's a, just a little bit of those two women in everything, constantly. Um, and. And these, I well, think, you can really it's, see it it's, there. it's easier to see yeah. a little bit of what Ron's talking about. I mean, it's kind of like the piling on of the, the shapes and almost the musical sound of the jewelry that it makes when you're wearing these earrings. And, and so you went from, you started with the gold, though, right? And then moved up in scale to the silver? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the pictures, they don't look that different, but they're in the exhibit. And yeah, we started small and then, you know, we play around a lot. So you don't want to just keep doing the same thing. So we went up and down in scale. And like these things are, are, were wax sheet that were then casted in metal and then, so hand fabricated in a way, but not forged. And that would be something that Ron would do. And then I would do things like carving in wax and that's where all the rings come from and all the, so they're two completely different things. And the sculptural work for us is really just not chain. Right. You know, we had always been working on chain, 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 necklaces, necklaces, and like, it was a chance to be more uh, sculptural, or more sculptor, and make things in a different way. That's really kind of why we did it. Yeah, I love it. Um, and then this is a pretty special uh, series of photographs that are on the top shelf in the center of the exhibition. And um, 
the, the, the kind of, we have, just have three of them here, so I wanted to go over them. First of all, because I think it's so, this was uh, for the 20th anniversary. And can you tell me a little about, bit about the process? Because you'll see, I think we have five. We have in, five. Five in the exhibition, 18. We're done, there's more. If you ever head over to the 10,000 Things Boutique, you'll see more there. Um, I'm not sure what it looks like at this point. It's a mess. We, we, we destroyed it. <laughs> don't come. We just, don't, don't go to the boutique right now. It's not a good time. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of blue tape on the wall from when we, we did the exhibit there. But, but can you tell everybody, I mean, how you did this? Because it's a really an incredible... Um, well, we, were, we, were, we had a lot of... I mean, as creative people, you are constantly pushing and trying to make something new or reach that next level. And... We wanted to move into high, like more fine, like high jewelry, not fine jewelry. We're already making fine jewelry, but like high jewelry with diamonds, which was so not our thing. And he's, uh, of course, Ron's uh, motivation was to like make a surface. I want the diamonds to glitter. I don't want it to be pave, like ugh. So we just were trying to make our version of high jewelry, and we chose the um, event of our 20th anniversary to do that, and we convinced, much as the, much like I, me convincing Marion to do this, we convinced Inez and Venud to join us in this experiment, and it was, took two years, and um, they were very gracious and kind, and it was all very glamorous and fun, and it was like the highest level of talent and styling, but it was all just for our little pieces that we were making. So it was, you know, it was, a, again, an exploration. The but, idea was an exploration. I mean, to tell everybody, I mean, to tell the kids, you know. So how do you get these big time photographers and these, you know, supermodels to do this? You, there was another component to the, what you did as well, right? The charity part of it. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Well, this was a little bit before it was, you know, the thing. And we had decided that we would, um, in order to honor the people that we were photographing, we would donate the piece, the sale of the piece, to their charity, and so it kind of was easier to get people to do it. And some of them are our long time, I mean, you know, there are people that we were in have, this um, that are, she's, Christy's been, I mean, that was the very first piece of editorial was Christy. Yeah, this is a beautiful piece, very different from, from the other things that you do, but another thing that these photographs show, they were eventually all published as a portfolio in V Magazine in 2013, um, and then this one, is, is your love of pearls. And there's a, a shelf in the exhibition that's all pearls that shows all kinds of pearls from uh, South Sea, Freshwater, Keshi, Baroque, and American natural pearls, which everybody may not necessarily know about, but they're kind of an obsession for the two of you. Oh. I mean, Ron's, I'm, you have to talk about pearls. No, you have American to talk, natural, Ron. I mean, I David, know, like, like, I'm um, like, now Amer I'm pulling David out. This is the opposite of how they normally are, <laughs> as everyone knows. Well, I just like how, <laughs> I just like how Ron talks about things. So, I do too, but I, I mean, it's great. Yeah. American natural pearls are farmed in the Mississippi River. Most people don't know that. They are, the, were considered at one point, and Ron can be, he can put a finer point on things, but they were the rarest of pearls. Um, Bahrain, you know, those pearls are also uh, natural, naturally occurring pearls, which means that they occur when they open the mollusk to take out the flesh to culture a pearl or to culture a pearl. Correct? They're like the incisions that go in the flesh. Well, if they're natural, they are, did you just open it to eat it? And then oh, and it's in there. in there. Oh, well, that's amazing. Because, well, they, when See? you read that it's like sand, but they say it's usually something else. Like I have um, natural pearls that look like snails, which have obviously crawled inside of the thing. And the carcass, yeah. But, um, so they're from the Mississippi River, and, and uh, it's a really great oh, American <laughs> natural uh, <laughs> element, and Ron got obsessed with and wanted to strive to use the finest materials, the most rare materials, and of course I had to say yes. And that's, you know, we've used them for, I don't know, almost, I'd say almost the, the entire 30 years, the minute we found yeah. them. Because there are two families that were primarily farming American natural pearls out of the Mississippi River, the Latondresses and the Peaches. And Mr. Latondress is long gone, and his family carries that on. And at this point, you're basically picking, you know, vintage parcels. We're picking through vintage parcels of American natural pearls. And sometimes they're very irregular and rough, and, but still very beautiful. And uh, in this case, those are sticks. I mean, you know, you see Chinese stick pearls, but these are not Chinese sticks. These are American natural pearl sticks which makes them even that much more desirable. 
And uh, the wing pearl shape, which uh, Jennifer Gandia has on, is a, and Gorgeous. somebody else, well, my sister has a pair on. Carol so it's, on. it's a shape like a shark's tooth, or we call them wings. But those have been, you know, they're in the charm necklaces. They're always in a charm necklace. Ron has a, you know, he always takes the best one. They're all around the room. Yeah, yeah with Ron having the best one. He always one. takes the best one. Yeah. There's a little pink conch pearl on this one. But, um, I yeah. love, oh, I love the conch pearl. But then um, things have changed since 2017 in terms of scale. There's no magnifier needed for this new work. Um, after you took a trip to Jaipur right. in 2017, right. what happened? Well, I was resistant to go, and Ron's more of an adventure, and I was like, I'm never going to India. I'm, I don't want to go. No, I'm not going. And yet they lasted 30 years. Go and, on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, you go, you go. And a friend of ours, Sarah Beltron, who makes a beautiful jewelry collection called Dezo, ab absolutely insisted that we go. And so we went, and the minute we landed, we were just madly in love with uh, the city and the country and the ease with which you can make things and the... Um, kind of very joyful experience and the, it just was all very positive and so we, we take our things, we take our materials, we take our tools and we sit on little benches with the guys who are insanely talented uh, carvers and we make things in wax or, or whatever, Some of, sometimes it's foam, whatever's fast and we kind of work back and forth until it's done and that enabled us to go in scale. Now, truthfully, we've been doing hand-cut stones almost the entire time. We started in Eder Oberstein, uh, which is a completely different level of cutting. It's like a much more fine gem, and uh, that lasted for a while, and, um, we did the, and then we picked it back up when this opportunity came. So we actually literally took a box of samples from that time, easily 15 years old, and looked at each other and were like, well, I don't know, what are we gonna make? Well, we have to go, well, we'll just make it up when we get there. And I said, well, let's take this box. And it kind of went from there. And once you start working with natural materials like that and you can make any shape you want, I mean, you know, what and, fun. Yeah, this is something that we haven't really talked about tonight in depth, but, but you're, neither of you are professionally trained as jewelers, and yet you do something that's quite rare for designer, the designer jewelry category, which is that you make everything on the bench, and you still do that. Oh yeah, and every day. And you don't day. have to do that, but you still... Oh, don't tell him that. <laughs> no. <laughs> they're, they're He's dying not but to do that's it. that's part of the, the art and the craft for you, obviously, and um, so I mention that now and here because even though David and Ron are working with lapidaries in India, I, I said to David, I was like, you know, these shapes are so incredible. They're so extraordinary. I mean, I don't even know how to describe these shapes. You know, what do you call, they're not like anything. I mean, what are they? And, and David's like, oh, I don't know. We, don't, we just make it up. And I think that there is a certain freedom in some ways to not having that baggage of being classically trained as a jeweler that you've definitely brought to this collection. And other things that you've talked to me about with these is there's always like a artistic operating principle going on with, with David and Ron, as we've seen with some of the artists that we've looked at and, and the you know, ancient Roman jewelry that you talked about you want the gems to interact. I mean, you said right now they're stacked, but we want them to interact. We're well, the, working yeah. towards that. Yeah, more and trade secrets. Shh. <laughs> we want the stones to intersect. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. They'll break, and it's you know, and then you got to go sit with somebody and say, no, no, you can cut it. No, you can do it. No, you can polish it. So it's you know, it's a journey. And it, even though this is new work and it's since 2017, there's a lot more to do. These yeah. are just more like that's based on the. Uh, you know, our fabulous friend Judy Geib here is wearing a chandelier, and we looked at the chandelier, and we're like, well, we'll just turn them into to discs, like stone discs. And um, so our work is always kind of referring to itself more yeah. than it refers to other things. Yeah, and the interaction you can kind of see on the lapis. It's no, not that's not what we want. I want to push it further. Okay, sorry. We're not there yet, I want yet, them to people. actually we're interact. Not like, <laughs> it's like, a work in progress, literally. And um, this is just another... Uh, you know, of your hand cut pieces. And I, I love having Kendall in here because we, we started this conversation with Kate Moss. I mean, it has nothing, you know, the, the, the supermodels, the editors, it still works, guys. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is amazing, I think, to see these credits come down. And um, 
You've done a lot of collaborations over the years, some with our friend in the front row, Jennifer Shanker, who must be called out Yay. for her Have a Heart initiative, and you did The Brilliant in Black, which we talked about briefly. And then this is kind of a little bit of a full circle moment, because also you started, when you began, you, you taught yourselves, you went to the museums and you went to um, the library to look at things, and then in 2021 or 2020, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art came calling to have you guys do a capsule collection after they launched the period room before yesterday we could fly. Um, can you tell me a little about that? Well, I mean, you know, if the Met calls you, you're going to definitely take that phone call. And we were so honored and um, the idea was so abstract that it really was attractive to us and the idea was to try to take, the idea, the, take Afrofuturism and make jewelry that would be appropriate for that idea, the idea of Seneca Village and what the museum was trying to say. And so we just studied, um, well, I mean, people think Afrofuturism is something that happened in the 70s, but it's something that happens every day. You have, you know, you have the Afropunk festival here. It's all, it's still very current in the culture and it's, uh, the, the uh, examples are everywhere. So it became for us like, how do we take what we do and take the ideas of, um, what's his name? I want to say George Clinton. Sun Ra. Clinton. Sun Ra. Sun Ra, which, you know, we had to look at the movies. and but George Clinton. Sort of, well, but we, but we figured Ra out after we watched Sun Ra that, oh, wait a minute, there's LaBelle and there's, style. you know, George Clinton and there's the, the whole history. Lifestyle. I mean, and then you see that little Nas X pictures and there's so much Afrofuturistic inspiration in the culture today and always has been. And so for us, it was just an honor to be able to think about things like the sun, and that's what that circle is supposed to be. It's supposed to be celestial, this hoop. It's a, you know, and then the Egyptian symbols, you know, which are all over the hieroglyphics in the Met. This was just making them abstract, but also incorporating, uh, you know, verified African beads. These are not, these are from African villages, uh, and this is a way of lifting them or honoring them in a very particular way, but also utilizing symbols that resonate. So evil eye, scarab, and then there was an onk, but it's not in that picture. With the African beads. With the African beads, mixing the two things. Yeah. Power symbols. Power Energy symbols. The yeah. Sun Ra. <laughs> That's Sun Ra. So it was a fat, you know, we learned a lot. It was amazing. It was a really fun collaboration. It took a lot of uh, research and a lot of uh, development. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love it. And I love the full circle moment. And, um, I haven't mentioned anything about the name of 10,000 Things, why it, you know, why you guys chose to, to call your company that 30 years ago. But, um, God, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... You know, my friend Kimberly Monk came up with that. We were doing the I Ching. We were, uh, trying to answer questions about life. And she said, you should call it 10,000 Things. But the fact is that it, if one thing begets 10,000 things, that's what you've really done for 30 years. It really seems like, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's been a meditation. I mean, if we weren't so busy the whole time, for her, <laughs> it might have felt like that, but it really did. And, you know, can, happy anniversary. What can thank I you. say? Yeah. Uh, were we supposed to do question and answer? I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Oh, yes. Of course you would. Lorraine. Do you remember how much you sold the flower of Jojo Teeth inspired flower necklace for? Do you remember the price? Yeah, I don't know. I also do. I don't remember. $2,500 or something like that. You know, it's a completely, it's a completely hand fat. Well, yeah, well, you know how it is. You make things and you don't ever put the real price on it. You just think, oh God, no one will ever buy that. I'm free labor. I made it. So yeah. that's why it was free just labor material. Too, right? There's no overhead. Yeah, we had to borrow. We had yes. to borrow back from her. Lorraine well, the, the, is asking the, the, the hard blue, questions. 
the blue enamel piece was made for the 20th anniversary. We don't have a picture of it in the exhibit. It was made for Dorothy Pearlstein, who is married to Philip Pearlstein, who's a legendary art figure. And actually, they were very good friends of ours. Dorothy passed. Philip is still painting to this day. But Ron and Philip became obsessed with each other because Ron, because Ron is Big Willie. Like, if he wants something, he's like, well, I'm going to ask. And so he got Philip to paint a portrait of him. And so they got to know each other. And it took, how long was that? It was every Tuesday for for summer. So three, four months. Right. And so we began yeah, very poor close summer, with, sorry. with Dorothy and Philip. And that blue enamel necklace was made as an homage to Dorothy. I mean, Dorothy was someone who Alice Neal painted twice. So we had to, you know, get it up there, make the right kind of thing for her. And that exists somewhere. Probably her daughter has it. And this is a lady in uh, Hudson. You, what, you want her address? <laughs> she might. She might sell it to you, Lorraine. <laughs> She might tell, or if you're real nice to him, he might make one. I mean, he still can. We can still do it. I think I'll do it. It makes me happy just looking at it, and I feel inspired again. Yeah. So, especially if you like it. Does anyone want an, else it. want to know what pieces were sold for? <laughs> yeah. The client list. Um, no, seriously, does anyone else have another question? Oh, God, no. Yes. Oh. Okay, so. Hundred percent. Yes. Thank you for asking. Okay. Part of making something that's your own was you. We couldn't figure out like what are we gonna what kind of clasp and Ron made this you know hand turned fish hook clasp and they're all made still. Madison makes them now and everybody makes them. <laughs> it's it's just our signature fish hook clasp and over the years people say oh I'm a lobster. But uh, one of my, one of my <laughs> brainier friends said, this is the strongest clasp you can make. There's no mechanism to break. There's no spring. There's no, and they are, you know, they get called into question, but it is very, very solid way to clasp a necklace. But it looks appropriate, and also it's from the history, the research. Ancient of, jewelry like, has yeah. those as well. And so it's, it's kind of an S clasp. Yeah. Well, it's almost like part of the necklace, you know what I mean? Like, if you don't care for show. Right. Exactly, exactly. Oh, God. Hi, Rima. Hi, Rima. Hi, Rima. Hi, Rima. Um, my question is, I would like to know for each of you, and it can just apply to this week, if you, have, if you each personally have a specific piece of jewelry, whether it's in your collection or not, that's like especially sentimental and meaningful to you and what that is. Well, I see you guys, you know, it's always changing. And that's a good question. I don't, I don't think I have a piece of, there, there are things that I've made that I feel very connected to and I hate when somebody buys them, but because then it's gone forever and, and you think you can remake things and you can't. It's very hard. To, he's always said that and I was always like, of course you can. And yeah, then I would sit down and... Ring you wear or several rings you wear? Well, I switched them up recently, but oh, no. Okay. There, you know, I, I don't really have a specific piece. I just have strong feelings for a lot of them. Rima, they were my flea market rings oh, that stole he stole from me. That's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Old Roman, um, Victorian and Roman stuff, so let's not get it. I did. I did I mean, see his room. But I was, was happy good, that he liked some. He was a very good collector of antique, like Georgian and simple rings, and, and he wasn't wearing them, so I took them. And I, I did wear those. So yeah, probably if I lost one of those, I'd be devastated. Probably. What about you? Um, honestly, this pearl, it's just a simple thing. I drilled it twice and just put a loop through it, and then I just later just kind of threw the conch pearl on it and it just it feels good to have with me um i am a jewelry shopper uh andrea lynette got me into it we bonded over that um torturing the people at the flea market and whatnot but at the same time it was shopping but it was also like an education and i bought things that i didn't wear there's all these pieces that are just on my wall that I just, it, it's like supporting someone else who made something. You know, it's like I'm wearing Castro's things, I'm wearing, um, oh, did it fall off? Uh, Melissa Joy Manning necklace. And it, it, I was like, you know, it feels like makeup. You really don't see it, but it just gives you like a little light. And strangely enough, it just makes me feel good. Um, what about you? No, I was just going to say from these two, Rima, 
I've been very impressed with David, who, you know, has kind of a uniform in his clothing. He changes his necklaces almost every day. I've been witness to this and very impressed. I think it's hard to change your jewelry every day. I think we're done, so everyone can, I hope you enjoy the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say a big thank you to Marion, to Ron, and to David for this incredible conversation and incredible exhibition. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I'd like, to, and, and I'd just like to invite all of you uh, to join our gallery hop. We have two additional galleries, all filled with jewelry on campus. Um, we have DeKalb Gallery, which is right across from the library. And then uh, just um, to the left of that, the next building, is our Steuben Gallery. And in that gallery, we have a reception. So please come and enjoy the work and, and enjoy the conversation and enjoy being together. And appreciating jewelry. Woo! <laughs>